Chapter 9 of The Flight of the Noldor After the black vapor finally disappears, Yavanna tries to revive the trees, but they're completely withered and dead. She can't remake them, and she, hol- she only had that power once, so she can never remake them again. Now the last remaining light from the trees only exists in the Silmarils. She says the only way she could possibly revive the trees is if she takes the light from the jewels. So the Valar asks Feanor if he would be willing to give them up. I think you can guess what his answer is. He says that he was only able to make the Silmarils once, and if he had to break them open and get the light out, then he would die. (laughs) He then broods for a bit and remembers Melkor's lies. Hey, these Valar really are after my precious jewels. Melkor was right, and he's a Valar as well. They're all the same thieves. I hate all of them. And just then, a messenger comes to the Ring of Doom and tells everyone that Melkor and Ungoliant went to Formenos, killed Finwë, and stole all the jewels hoarded there, including the Silmarils. So after hearing this, Feanor calls Melkor Morgoth which means Black Foe of the World. So from now on, no one calls Melkor Melkor anymore, but rather Morgoth. Then Feanor rushes back up to Formenos and grieves for his father. He actually loved Finwë even more than the Silmarils, so he is just, he's just mad with grief and total rage. He's blind with rage. He's also even angrier now at the Valar for having summoned him to the feast on Taniquetil and keeping him away from Formenos. He's like, oh, if only I had been there, and then maybe my father would not have been killed, you know? So he's, needless to say, he's a little cranky. Uh, Meanwhile, Morgoth and Ungoliant escape north through the cold, barren region of Araman in the north of Amman. Then they come across a strait of glaciers and icebergs called the Helkaraxe, or Grinding Ice. They go across that and arrive in the north of Middle-earth, actually very close to the ruins of Angband, his former western fortress. Now this whole time, Morgoth has actually been trying to get away from Ungoliant, but he soon realizes he can't escape her. She then reminds him that he had promised her treasure to eat, so he feeds her all the jewels that they stole, And as he feeds her, she grows bigger and bigger. And he's weakened now and exhausted, so she's very intimidating to him. She then demands the Silmarils, but he refuses to give them up. Now keep in mind, even though the jewels are locked in a little crystal case, they're actually burning his hand that's holding them because he's so evil. They're burning him right through the crystal. And after he refuses to give the Silmarils to her, she tries to strangle him in a web. Then he lets out the most blood-curdling scream ever, and it's so loud that the Balrogs in the deepest, most hidden parts of Angband hear him and come up to help him. They save him, and Ungoliant flees to a mountain range farther south called Ered Gorgoroth. After many years, she breeds a bunch of spider offspring that make their home in those mountains. And fun fact, she is... I'm almost 100% sure, the ancestor of Shelob from The Lord of the Rings. So Morgoth starts summoning all his old servants, and he rebuilds and fortifies Angband. He raises three mountain peaks above the gates. These mountains are called Thangorodrim. Angband is like Mordor on steroids, with a permanent shadow, a foul smell, and tons of evil creatures just constantly running around. And Morgoth makes for himself a great crown of iron, and he called himself the king of the world. In token of this, he set the Silmarils in his crown. His hands were burned black by the touch of those hallowed jewels, and black they remained ever after. Nor was he ever free from the pain of the burning and the anger of the pain. That crown he never took from his head, though its weight became a deadly weariness. Meanwhile, the Valar sit in the Ring of Doom for a long time. Feanor then suddenly appears down in Tyrion and declares that he is now king of the Noldor, since Fienwë's dead. Then he talks to the Noldor. He was a master of words, 
and his tongue had great power over hearts when he would use it. And that night he made a speech before the knoll door, which they ever remembered. Fierce and fell were his words, and filled with anger and pride. And hearing them, the knoll door were stirred to madness. So think about it. He's so sad about the death of his father. He's enraged at the theft of the Silmarils, and his hatred for Morgoth is just out of control even though the things he's telling everyone actually come from Morgoth's lies originally. He says that the Valar failed to protect them against Morgoth, and that the Valar wanted to keep them in Amon against their will. He says they should leave for Middle-earth in order to be free and rule their own lands. He then says that they should declare war on Morgoth and regain the Silmarils. Then they will surely become a mighty people. Feanor then swears his infamous oath, which his seven sons also swear in front of everyone. They swear an unbreakable oath in the name of Iluvatar, that they will pursue and kill anyone who keeps a Silmaril from them. And if they fail, they'll be cursed to everlasting darkness. Now, this is a crazy vow to make. The consequences of this oath will shape much of the drama in the coming chapters. After hearing this oath, Fingolfin and his son Turgon speak out against Feanor, and of course tensions rise and the two sides almost get into a fight. Then Finarfin and his son Orodreth say to the Noldor that they should really stop and think about what they're planning to do before they do something they might regret. Finrod, the oldest son of Finarfin, agrees with Turgon, who is his cousin, but they're also really best friends. And Galadriel is actually quite eager to go to Middle-earth and rule her own realm, wherever that may be. Her cousin Fingon, Fingolfin's oldest son, agrees with her because he also wants to rule his own place too. Galadriel's older brothers, Angrod and Aignor, also want to go. So in the end, Feanor manages to persuade almost all the Noldor to leave Tyrion and head for Middle-earth. But most of the Noldor would actually prefer to have Fingolfin rather than Feanor as their king. So as they're leaving, a smaller host follows Feanor in the lead, while the much larger host follows Fingolfin behind. So uh, Fingolfin, however, he actually doesn't really want to go. I mean, he goes for three basic reasons. One, because his son Fingon has urged him. Two, he doesn't want to abandon his people to the crazy whims of Feanor. And three, he has to keep his promise of loyalty that he made to Feanor at Manwe's feast. See, he shouldn't have made that promise. Uh, Finarfin goes as well, but he especially doesn't want to leave Amon. And only a very small group of Noldor remain in Tyrion. They never go at all. Then a herald comes from Manwe and tells everyone, hey, this is not a good idea, and the Valar will not help you in your quest. The herald tells Feanor that his oath has now exiled him, and that he will never, ever be able to defeat Morgoth on his own, because he just isn't powerful enough. Feanor then tells the herald that even if he can't beat Morgoth, at least he's making an effort, unlike the Valar, who just sit in the Ring of Doom and don't take any action. So, the Noldor just continue on. They're heading north. But Feanor soon realizes that he can't actually take the entire host of the Noldor into the far, far north, and the only way to get across the sea has to be by ship. So, he goes to Alqualonde, the city where he tries to persuade the Teleri to join the Noldor in their mm, trip, <laughs> little trip to Middle-earth and let them use their ships. But the Teleri do not listen to him. Because remember that Morgoth never went to the lands of the Teleri. He kind of ignored them. So neither Olwe nor his people ever heard Morgoth's lies. They're kind of pure of heart and, and pure of mind. And Olwe tells Feanor that their ships are like the jewels of the Noldor. They're so dear to them and so precious that their greatness can never truly be replicated. So they, would, they, would, they will never part with their ships. Once Feanor's host finally catches up to him in Alqualonde, they just start to take the ships by force. So awful. But the Teleri fight them off. 
Then the front of Fingolfin's host, so not the whole group, but just the, the front led by Fingon, get involved in the fighting. Uh, they're actually under the impression that the Tellery started the fight, not realizing that it's really all Feanor's fault. Uh, the Noldor win because their weapons, remember, are much better than the Tellery's. They've been spending many years making strong weapons. The Tellery only have bows and arrows, really, and a couple swords here and there. So the Noldor wind up stealing the ships and heading north along the coast with the rest of the Noldor walking along the shore. So this very violent episode where many Tellery are killed is called the first kinslaying. Kinslaying meaning when elves kill other elves, and it's obviously a very serious crime. I mean, this is just awful. Just as they reach the border of Araman, Mandos himself appears and pronounces the doom of the Noldor, in which he predicts endless woe to them if they continue on their quest and refuse to turn back and ask the Valar for pardon. If they keep going, then they will never be allowed back into Aman, and the House of Feanor will fail to regain the Silmarils, and everyone will experience either suffering, death, or just extreme weariness of living. At this terrifying pronouncement, Finarfin and many of his people turn back. However, none of Finarfin's children go with him. They continue on with the rest of the Noldor because they don't want to forsake Fingolfin's children. Uh, Finarfin and his small group receive pardon from the Valar, and he is made king of the Noldor in Tyrion. Fingolfin's host does not turn back partly because some of them participated in the kinslaying, but also because they're just really determined to go to Middle-earth. The Noldor keep going north because the distance across the sea to Middle-earth is much shorter up there than it is farther south, as you can see by the map. So the host finally gets to the Helkaraxe, a place of vast fogs and mists of deathly cold and the sea streams were filled with clashing hills of ice and the grinding of ice deep sunken. Feanor discusses with his sons that the only ways across the sea are by ship or by walking over the ice. They decide that an ice crossing is impossible, but they also realize that there are not enough ships to carry everyone over at the same time. Unwilling to wait for everyone to be ferried over, they and their followers instead secretly sail away, leaving Fingolfin's host stranded. That's nice, right? <laughs> God, Feanor's so mean. But once Feanor and his followers land in Middle-earth, his oldest son, Maedros, says, All right, now that we're across, who are we going to send back with the ships to get the rest of the Noldor? And who gets to come back first? Maybe Fingon? Maedros asks this because he and his half-cousin Fingon used to be best friends before Morgoth's lies kind of drove a wedge between uh, the House of Feanor and the House of Fingolfin. And Feanor just says, heck no, let's burn the ships instead. I never liked those guys anyway. <laughs> so, whoa! So Maedros just stands aside. He does not participate in the ship uh, burning. I think he still feels enough friendship towards Fingon that he wouldn't feel right in leaving him high and dry like that. Like, that's kind of a, a jerky move to make. And Fingolfin and his people saw the light afar off, red beneath the clouds, and they knew that they were betrayed. This was the first fruits of the kinslaying and the doom of the Noldor. So Fingolfin is mad now. He's very angry and more determined than ever to get to Middle-earth and probably tell Feanor off. He and his people then decide they have to cross the Helkaraxe. This is an arduous task. Some people die, including Turgon's wife. Uh, but, you know, they're still quite strong and not yet weary of the world. They've just come from the Undying Lands, so they can push on, and they finally do make it to the shores of Middle-earth. Few of the deeds of the Noldor thereafter surpassed that desperate crossing in hardihood or woe. And at this point, no one in that crowd is very fond of Feanor. 